Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I, I appreciate that. I want to thank Riet for hosting me. I want to thank Rethinking Russia, which brought me to Moscow. They had a conference a couple days ago. I thought it was very interesting. We talked about the interface between um, political action and political ideologies and ideas and um, how Russia, putting Russia in comparative perspective with the other Western democracies. So I thought, I, I thought it was very insightful and I know they're going to continue working on developing their ideas, so there will be more opportunities for us to learn from that. Um, I want to uh, thank the MacArthur Foundation, which is supporting my research on Russia, China, and U.S. relationship, particularly trying to promote non-proliferation cooperation between the three countries. Um, and я разучился говорить по-русски, но все еще понимаю. So if you still, if you want to, if you if you prefer, it's up to you. You're welcome to ask me a question in Russian, or if you want to make comments, which is also helpful for us, feel free to do that in Russian as well. And, and along those lines, though, my talk is on uh, non-proliferation. We can, if, if the moderator permits, we can talk about anything you want. Really, you want to talk about Donald Trump? You want to talk about, you know, Syria? I'm, I'm happy. To, I'm here to learn. So anything that we can talk about is, is fine with me. Um, I would I wouldn't call the trilateral relationship a crisis, and I wouldn't even say that the non-proliferation regime itself is in, in crisis. It's under a lot of strain. Um, but I mean, I'm glad you asked that. You made me think. Just sticking back and looking at the whole picture, where we are, we still got fairly good relations at, when focusing on specific proliferation problems, particularly Iran and North Korea, despite the tensions between uh, Russia and the United States over uh, Ukraine and other issues, NATO enlargement, and despite the tensions between China and the United States over you know, your, your expertise, uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole maritime disputes and East and, and South China, uh, China Seas. Um, for the most part, especially when you talk to the American diplomats and, I, and whenever I get a chance to Russian and Chinese equivalents, they're satisfied with their relationship. I mean, the, pro the, the, the complexity is these are really difficult problems. So even if the United States and Russia and China can agree, you know, we don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, well, then there's a problem how you get there and, and, and how do you get the, 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 the party that you want in Pyongyang to influence. And, and Russia has been more successful than most of us, and we only engage Pyongyang, but still hasn't gained the kind of leverage which wouldn't be needed to really force a change in decision there. Um, it, somewhat like Syria, and even if I think if Russia and the U.S. can come to a peace agreement, that, that's, you're still missing some key actors there, but we can talk about that if you want later. Um, and so if you... Now, the reason why I'm focusing on the, the Russia, the U.S., and China, um, I think we all, we all see that in, in many areas of the world they are still the most important, or at least among the most important countries. Uh, and I think for non-proliferation, this is especially true, that uh, for if you consider which of their countries' military actions have the most effect on proliferation dynamics, I mean, the United States on one level has given a lot of security guarantees to countries, which Americans argue, I think, correctly, uh, helps prevent them from developing their own nuclear weapons. I'm thinking in particular uh, South Korea, at one time Germany, maybe in the future uh, some um, Gulf states through extended insurance. Um, and uh, conversely, there are countries that are uh, at times have sought or considered thinking getting nuclear weapons out of concern about the United States, I think particularly Iran and North Korea. Uh, in the case of Russia, it's clear that you know Russia's if 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 Russia does not uh, it, it does not cooperate with the U.S. or at least I mean, we don't agree on the, what outcome we want to achieve on certain of these critical issues, uh, we won't get positive results. And, and conversely, uh, if it wasn't for Russia's support in the case of Iran deal, and then Secretary Kerry and I think President Obama have said this, uh, we wouldn't have gotten it. So it was it was absolutely critical for the Russia role Russia played in those negotiations, despite the fact. I think we understand Russia was a bit cross-pressured on 
their, their cost to Russia of a deal and their benefits from Russia of the deal. And you, know, you could have argued either way. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was a, I think at least the American diplomats were surprised by how much cooperation they got from Russia and from Europe. They were kind of surprised by how strongly the Europeans stood behind the sanctions, uh, which um, you know, didn't really cost the U.S. anything since we had no economic ties with Iran, but it did cost the Germans and the French and others a lot of money to enforce those. And China uh, is important, increasingly so. We've got a more assertive Chinese leadership, whereas in the past I think they would have just gone along with if the Russian and the U.S. could come to an agreement on something, the Chinese wouldn't try and stand in the way. Now, um, in, particularly in the case of North Korea, but Iran, other areas, they could, they're out there uh, playing important roles in promoting non-proliferation in the case of Iran and trying to grapple with the North Korea problem, which we are all struggling with. And there are other domains, uh, particularly in terms of our civilian nuclear industries that are very important for if we can get safe and secure nuclear energy deals that will help counter non-proliferation and convert if we're not careful, our, our, we could contribute to that. Um, I thought I will focus a bit on the Iran deal and Korea, um, and, and, in, and more quickly we can mention some of the other areas because I, I just th those are the two that I want to cover. In the, in the, because I don't want to take too much time. Because I'm really interested in your views on these. Um, the Iran deal. It's it's quite obvious that we're going to need continue Russia, China, uh, U.S. cooperation to see it go forward. I mean, the three countries stood firm, and I think that helped to persuade the Iranians to agree to the terms of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the GCPOA. I don't even know what the Russian acronym is, but, uh, but you, I mean, we, we, you, you presumably, you know, you, you know the terms since you're all, you're all familiar with this. Basically, you have Iranian cut back a lot of its uh, enriched Iranian stockpiles on its capacity to enrich uranium to remake its plutonium reactor, Chinese are playing a critical role in that. Russia has played a critical role in dealing with the uranium stockpiles of the uranium, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the uranium in, in return for other, I think it was yellow cake in return. Um, there's uh, in return, the relaxation of sanctions. It's difficult for the U.S. to uh, relax all the sanctions. So I'm not sure if the Iranians thought they would get a lot of trade or investment from the United States. Um, I, I think they understood that that wasn't going to happen. I think their key benefit from the deal in terms of the U.S. is you don't have the U.S. Treasury go around to India or South Korea or Europe and say, you know, you trade with Iran, you're, you know, we're going to pour all these sanction on you. The U.S. has stopped doing that, and so that gives Iran benefits from the other countries. Um, but there's some things the U.S. still can't do, uh, which Russia and China can, uh, making sure that as Iran develops a civilian nuclear energy that is proliferation resistant, but also safe and secure. I mean, Boucher is a bit of a mess since we've had a series of countries take over and try and put that together, start off the Germans and so on. So there's, always, there's a little question about how safe that is but any future system, we want to make sure that, that it's got Russian or Chinese or some advanced uh, expertise looking at it to make sure that it's safe. Um, and in terms of what to do with the spent fuel, I mean, Russia's got a great take-back arrangement in which Russia gives Iran the fuel and then take from Boucher and then takes it back so it can't be used to, to, as a source of weapons. And I'd like to see that continue and expand. Um, now, it's not totally rosy. We've got potential problems. I mean, as far as I understand, Iran's fully implemented it. Um, but we may see a different Iranian government in the future that may be less supportive of the nuclear deal. Even if not, the, the deal itself is of limited duration. So there's a question of what Iran will do it, as if it, it's what it's going to become now is sort of a virtual nuclear state like Germany or Japan. It's, it could, could get nuclear weapons soon if it made such a decision. And so we have to think about how to discourage such a decision. Uh, there's uh, the so-called procurement channel. The, the trick we have is Iran, we want 
Iran, we, we can't block everything that Iran wants to get that could be potentially sensitive uh, in terms of, uh, because then that will just go through the black market and we'll lose all, trans, you know, we'll lose a lot of visibility of what they're doing, but, but we also have to make sure that we don't actually give them a technology that they could be used to make in a nuclear weapon or related. The problem is Russia and the U.S. and China are differing a bit on some of the related issues, particularly the, the missile question, the ballistic missile question. Um, it, now, it, the, itself, this is reflected the fact that the agreement, the, the, the terms of how, how to treat missiles is a bit ambiguous. It's not technically part of the Iran nuclear deal. We decided to put everything aside to get the nuclear deal. Um, but there are other Security Council provisions that, that, that call on Iran not to test uh, missiles that could carry a nuclear weapon. And there's a debate between Russia and and U.S. now about if Iran does not comply, which it you know, clearly is not, it said it, it never said it would. It said it, it considers this inappropriate, this restriction. What do we do? Um, and the U.S. is un putting unilateral sanctions on, and the Russian government and the Chinese government are opposing those that imply there some, should be some restrictions on their government's activity, their, their company's activities. So we'll need to sort that out. I think it can be though sorted out, just if we focus on the technical issue rather than the juridical issue. Um, one, another area where I think we could cooperate is the International Atomic Energy Agency itself. It's going to be a challenge just monitoring the Iran. It's such a large country. It's got extensive nuclear activities. It, by its own admission, went out and it had to develop a sophisticated uh, means of procuring uh, goods and so on that were denied to it by the sanctions and now sanctions relax, but they still have that expertise. Um, and the, the, the agency is going to try out some new detection technologies, environmental detection, and so on. But we're, we're not sure how that's going to work. And they're going to need more money, and we need to train the next generation of monitors and so on. So that's an area where I think we're going to have to work further. And, and, and again, Russia and China can be helpful in the sense that the Iranians, I think, are more comfortable working with their nuclear experts than U.S. experts. Somewhat. I'm not sure entirely they trust anybody, but certainly there. Um, in terms of uh, Korea, this is a harder problem. And the Russian position is a is interesting. I mean, the, the U.S. position is is been we're not going to deal with North Korea until they go back and agree to uh, compl uh, comply with their nuclear commitments, uh, stop cease their uranium program, cease their plutonium program, and uh, eliminate it in a verifiable and controllable manner. Um, and the North Korea says it won't do that, and so we, that's where we've been for the past eight years. There's been no real dialogue. There's been pretty much stalemate. We've got an Iranian, uh, a North Korean nuclear or missile test every couple of years, and so we're sort of in this deadlock. And the U.S., the next U.S. team is going to have to rethink what they're going to do. Uh, uh, it's times the U.S. has tried to rely on China to help solve this problem. There are those in the U.S. who think that if the Chinese just really put their foot down, they could force North Korea to to stop their nuclear program. I mean, it would. Be Entail cutting back luxury goods and, and enforcing a lot of uh, prohibitions on the activities of Chinese um, entities that appear to be uh, cooperating with North Korean entities that appear to be linked to the nuclear program. Um, there's much of the exchanges that go on between Iran and North Korea, which are not nuclear, they're more missile. Uh, they pass through China. Um, and the Chinese have always said, well, we, we don't want, and I believe them, they don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, they don't want them to test these missiles, but they are concerned, as I say, about the people of North Korea, and they don't want to ruin their relations with this crazy government there. They don't say that, but that's sort of how I read it. Um, they're concerned about uh, the, I mean, I think if you, when a push comes to sub, they would rather have a North Korea under the current regime than risk its collapse and, and the follow through, which might be reunification under U.S. and South Korea, or uh, you know, massive refugees, nuclear material, whatever, or war or something. So in the end, 
they rather they'll stick with the current regime and try and reform it. I think their hope is that this government, the Kim dynasty, will follow the same path China did. I mean, it was a very uh, aggressive, a sort of approach to nuclear weapons and under Mao, and then it basically mellowed out and, and joined the international system and came in favor of non-proliferation and so on. So I think their hope is they can, over time, North Korea will change. Um, and the U.S. argument is we don't have that time. That, uh, that, that if we wait, I mean, if eventually North Korea will get a com missile that can launch a nuclear warhead at the United States and, and so on. Now, the Russia position is interesting. I'm not sure I fully where to understand where it is now, so I'd be, I'm open to in insights on this. I mean, Russia clearly does not want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, and it doesn't like these missile tests because, I mean, like the Chinese and the USA, this just gives the U.S. an excuse to build up its missile defenses in, in the region um, and leads to high scale tensions. Now, Russia, in the, under the past few years at least, has played an interesting role in trying to engage the, the North Korean government. Um, and has been more successful than that when the Chinese, I think, because for reasons I don't fully understand, the, the uh, Kim Jong-un just doesn't like the Chinese government. I don't know, maybe he was mistreated when he was, you know, by then when his child or something, but he thought he was disrespected. Anyway, he just doesn't get along how with the Chinese, I mean, you probably know this better since it's your area, but he doesn't seem to get along. And, and, he's, and one of his ways to manage this, is, I think, is to move closer to Russia. And at least President Putin as far as I recall, even go back to 1990, he's always been interested in trying to reach out to North Korea and get that government to change. I think he made a you know, visit there when he was first president and in, I think it was, yeah, it was 2000, was it? When he went there and he almost got a missile deal. And then since then, it's been on and off, but he's been um, working with them. And in the last two years, it was really looking like they're making a lot of progress at the, between them, the moscow Pyongyang relationship. Uh, there were a lot of deals announced exchange of visitors and it looked like Kim was going to come to the May Day Parade and uh, that would have been good, get him out of the shell in Pyongyang, you know, park had gone maybe they could have talked and, and but for whatever reason it, he didn't, he sent somebody else and, and, and since then it's not clear to me the relationship has been going anywhere um, what I found interesting is some recent uh, Russian government statements For uh, there was that one in particular about warning North Korea that if it keeps on peace and security, and that you know, the U.S. And the Security Council was obliged to deal with that, and that could affect um, you know, North Korean security. I'm curious what was behind that. Um, now, just basically, fundamentally, I think there's a, a difference between the three countries on what they're willing to do, and again, I'm not totally sure on Russia's position. The U.S. would prefer regime change. I mean, it's clear the U.S. would rather have a different government in North Korea, and so they're willing to take the risk of instability to do that within reason. The Chinese, as we mentioned, the obverse, they want a buffer state there. Uh, they they rather have, though in the end they'd rather they choose stability over non proliferation. Um, and I don't think they want reunification under any any current scenario. Russia, I'm not sure about. I mean I think Russia could go, could accept reunification under some conditions. There's certainly economic benefits for Russia. A lot of the economic plans would want to link the, you know, link the two parts of Korea and, and that as a means to bring Russia closer to East Asian economic uh, dynamics uh, through the railroad, uh, energy, and other conduits through the Korean Peninsula. It would remove a source of instability on Russia's side. It would perhaps, I think Russia might demand uh, limits on the, or removal of all the U.S. forces from the region and, and so on in return for reunification. But I don't think it's fundamentally opposed to it the way uh, I think the Chinese still are, despite some changes in their views. Uh, beyond that, there's some other issues. I mean, the NPT review conference, as we know, ended in stalemate. It wasn't too alarmed. Only half of them actually are able to reach a consensus. The reason it broke up and had really nothing to do with the Russia-China-U.S. dynamic. It was a fight between the United States and, and, and Egypt over 
the wording of uh, the WMD free zone for Israel. I mean, the U.S. argument was the terms have to be something that Israel will accept or they won't come to the WMD conference, and the Egyptians uh, were more insistent that the, the, Israel had to make a commitment to give up its uh, whatever weapons of mass destruction it has to participate. And, that, and that, we got into this fight, and that's, that's really what disrupted it. Um, I don't think the conditions are right, right for WMD free Middle East at the moment. I mean, even with the Iran deal uh, and the Syria chemical deal, the whole region's in, a, in so chaos. I, I don't know. It just doesn't seem right for me. South Asia, I don't know as much about, so I'd be interested in what people think on that. The U.S. has, has always been trying to cap or somehow affect the dynamic between India and Pakistan. Just uh, and, and there's a fear that as they develop low yield nuclear weapons, as they develop uh, expand their forces, it's just you're it's just waiting for some terrorist incident to trigger a kind of dynamic we don't want to see. Uh, and the dispute is, is it's been a bit under the table, but it's a bit between China and the U.S. over to what extent you're willing to pressure to Pakistan, uh, since the Pac- China obviously wouldn't want Pakistan to parity with India, um, and, and and the Russian position is a little less visible to me. Russia's relations with Pakistan have improved recently, and so I'm, I'd be interested in how that could shape itself. Uh, comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Russia's the good guy here. Russia has ratified the CTPT. China and the U.S. have not. I suspect the Chinese are waiting for the U.S. I don't think, I don't think they're waiting. They really want to test nuclear weapons. But um, the U.S. for domestic reasons and others is just not going to ratify it anytime soon, I don't think. Um, something I think is more optimistically, we're making a lot of progress, I think, on this P5 process, the permanent five members of the Security Council have been meeting together, um, talk, I mean, Russia and the U.S. have long had these kind of dialogues about proliferation dynamics and definitions of terms and so on, and I, now I think it's engaging the Chinese more. They took charge of writing the agreed terminology recently. That's an interesting era, I think, for further development. I mean, as you know, the other countries criticize the P5 for not making fast enough reductions in, in, in nuclear weapons. Um, and so engaging in this dialogue is a useful means to consider how to address those concerns. Um, there's a, a, a bit of tension over this U.S. initiative about um, verification. How do you, you, The U.S. is interested in trying to make clear to countries that don't have nuclear weapons how difficult it would be to verify a nuclear-free world. Um, and so we've been trying to uh, explain to them just some of the challenges. And Russia and China have objected a bit because it, it, there's some concern we're violating the uh, NPT provision about sharing nuclear knowledge with non-nuclear states. And so we'll have to figure out what we're going to do with that. Um, the uh, there's some tools I think we might consider further development. I'm just going to end here because I think we're running out of time. The three I would highlight would be um, the, uh, the, uh, the making a safer next generation nuclear reactors, more safe, secure, self-contained units. The uh, global initiative against nuclear terrorism in which we work on um, a whole range of areas in my workshops on you know, forensics, on state and local authorities, how to respond to nuclear incidents on a variety of ways. It's been a good dialogue. And then this proliferation security initiative, which is uh, something Russia is involved in, but China is not, I think because of North Korea, about uh, limiting the um, transit, uh, particularly through uh, the sea, of uh, missiles and uh, you know weapons of mass destruction and their means of delivery, so missiles and nuclear technology. That, that's something we'll, we might see further development. But I think at this point I'll just end it. Um, I just threw out some ideas or other challenges and opportunities, but I, I think we can go through a good dialogue. It's brilliant.